and then we will start our webinar today. Right. Oh, we're still on zero. All right. I'm going to start today's webinar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sada and Ohasa webinar. This is number two for us for Ohasa. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone today and thank you for joining us. Uh, we are getting more people logging in at the moment. Um, I'm just going to go through some general house rules uh, before we begin. Uh, please refrain from using the raised hand function, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. Um, and the CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform and we'll, you'll be able to access them um, under your SADA profile. If you don't have a SADA profile, you'll be able to create one for yourself um, and access your CPD um, certificates afterwards. The event for today's uh, webinar qualifies for two CEUs um, and we're also streaming live on YouTube. So just in case you have access or you, you, not, you don't have access to Zoom, you're more than welcome to stream uh, from YouTube. Uh, and then just one announcement to make. On the 20th of April, SADA and Bits Dental faculty will be having the um, webinar with Dr. Kogetsu Chitze. And the topic will be radiological differential diagnosis uh, describing a lesion. So please register for that. The emails would have been sent through to you already. So register and join the webinar. All right. So I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, today's program. Um, well, actually, I'm just gonna go straight into the, into the uh, CV of our first uh, speaker today, Dr. Peter van der Beil. Actually, no. I'm lying. It's Prof. Uh, Peter van der Bell. We have father and son today who are joining us. Um, and I'd just like to introduce myself. I think I forgot. My name is Kauki Sipuru and I am the Ohasa Gauteng Chairperson. And I'm going to go straight into it now. Okay. So our first speaker, Prof. Peter van der Bell, a senior, graduated from the University of Cape Town with a BSc Ons in 1969 and continued his studies receiving a PhD chemistry from the same university in 1979. In 1981, Prof. van der Beel graduated with a BCHD from the University of Stellenbosch, followed by on BSc Medical Sciences Pharmacology cum laude in 1985 and DSc um, Odontology in 1998. Prof. van der Beel has studied and traveled extensively inter inter internationally and has since 2010 held the position of invited foreign professor at Pirigov's Russian National Research Medical University in Moscow. Prof. Peter van der Beel holds a, holds a patent for the development of a synthetic pulmonary surfacent um, sun, sunsurf, uh, which has been patented in South Africa with patents in other countries pending. Sunsurf has been selected by ISIS, which is the Innova uh, Innovation Office, University of Oxford, for their website um, as a promising product. Prof is both an internal and external examiner for under as well as postgraduate students. He has authorized, uh, well, he's authored and co authored 168 articles um, that have been published uh, in or accepted by peer reviewed journalists. Whew, I could go on the whole morning. So I think I should uh, let Prof begin his webinar. Thank you, and Prof, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And uh, it's only a pleasure being here and being able to present another lecture to, uh, to my colleagues. And I hope uh, you will enjoy. Uh, Peter. Okay, we'll just wait for Prof to share his screen and then we'll get our webinar started. Peter, who's sharing his screen? Yeah. Okay. Can he 
искричнени. Ти вика? Right. Well, again, good morning and thank you for uh, being uh, part of the audience. I hope we can uh, tell you a few things about pain control and about the whole issue of codeine and oral health care as used by healthcare professionals in South Africa. Just want to say a few things about the nature of pain. It's an aversive sensory and emotional experience and typically caused or resembling that caused actual of or potential tissue injury. This was the definition that was proposed in 2019 by the International Association for the Study of Pain. It's important to remember that it's always a subjective experience that is influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. It's often initiated by noxious stimuli, but it may sometimes be totally psychogenic. The pain impulses are then transmitted and modulated at multiple centers en route to higher centers in the brain. And these processes underscore the complexity of the natural, the neural phenomena involved in the pain processing process. Now, what are the functions of pain? It can sometimes protect the body against harmful influences, but sometimes it can be quite useless, such as phantom limb pain, neuralgias, atypical facial pain, I'm sure you've seen examples of that. And then the question always remains, if a patient has one of these atypical types of pains, who do you refer this patient to? It's certainly not something that you're going to attend to or usually not, but which specialist would you refer this person to? And the interpretation of pain, it also varies between individuals, social groups, cultures, and the effects, and, the, and this all affects the attitudes to pain. It features prominently in differences between acute and chronic pain. There is such a thing as a threshold value of pain. Pain can vary throughout the daylight, day-night cycles in any one individual. They might experience more pain, usually at night, oftentimes at night, sometimes <clears throat> in the daytime, excuse me. The mechanisms of pain, the acute versus the chronic, are considerably different, and hence the threshold values can fluctuate, and hence the pain management needs to reflect these differences. The threshold values are lowered by discomfort, exhaustion, anxiety, fear, anger, and depression. Keep that in mind when you are treating a patient for pain. And they are raised by sympathy, understanding, relaxation, and sleep. It can often be managed by drugs, but the emotional state and the relative stress levels of the patient must also be taken into account. Due to the cyclic nature of pain, prophylaxis is more effective than treatment of established pain, and patients must be encouraged to take the analgesics on a regular basis. If the prescription for that particular drug says four hourly, six hourly, eight hourly, or whatever, that patient must adhere to that. The pain can also sometimes be managed by physical methods, neurectomy, alternative medicine techniques, the whole lot of them, electronic dental analgesia, heat, cold rubbing, pressure, microvibrators, and all of the rest of that, you know, people will tell you about that. Behavioral techniques such as desensitization, hypnosis, and relaxation training may also be of benefit, particularly when chronic pain is involved. Drugs that can be used in the pharmacological management of pain can be divided into three categories. There are those drugs agents which are not analgesics, in other words, not pain drugs per se, which may eliminate the causes of pain. If the pain is due to an infection, an abscess or something like that, an antibiotic or antivirals, antifungals in the mouth, if there's pain from the mucosa can be effective. Fluorides, other agents can be used for desensitizing dentine. Topical anesthetics can be used to eliminate pain. You can also use them diagnostically if you're trying to isolate the area where the pain coming, is coming from. Coating agents, mouth rinses, uh, et cetera, 
And then, of course, the pulpal agents, which you all know so well, which you put inside the teeth, can also be used to uh, control pain. There are also drugs which interfere with the sensitivity of peripheral pain receptors or inhibit the nerve conduction. And here we are specifically thinking of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or the enzymes as they are known. We'll focus on that just now. Paracetamol, acetaminophen, as the Americans like to call it, is generally not considered to be an enzyme because it only has minor anti-inflammatory properties. It is therefore classified as a miscellaneous analgesic, which possibly inhibits the peripheral COX enzymes. We'll come to those just now. And there are some other identified mechanisms. Although this drug has been around for a long time, there are still a number of things about it that we do not know. And then of course, the local anesthetics, but also including a diverse of groups such as other agents, phenol, menthol, thymol, antihistamines, and so can have pain alleviating properties. Then there are the drugs which act centrally and they alter the perception and or the interpretation of pain. And here we are thinking of the narcotic analgesics, analgesics, the opiates, the opioids, if we're going to that a little bit deeper, the general anesthetics, the gases, including nitrous oxide, and analgesic adjuvants, drugs which are typically used for indications other than pain, but they help to provide control of pain in some painful diseases. And we're thinking of antidepressants, muscle relaxants, anticonvulsants, antihistamines, and then the stimulants such as caffeine, cocaine, et cetera. If we just look at this in a pictorial manner, then you will see that the drugs that work in the peripheral, the non-steroidals work at the level of in the periphery of the tooth, if there's an abscess there causing pain, it acts on the inflammatory mediators in that region. The local anesthetics uh, interfere with the pain uh, conduction to the, to the center, to the, to the nerve centers in the brain. And then the opiates and the opioids, the centrally acting analgesics, they work in the brain itself in centers, which we'll have a look at. And then this is, of course, where APAP, which is the uh, a name again that they use sometimes for n acetylparaminophenol, cetaminophenin, or paracetamol. They also work in the also works in some centers in the brain, and we're not so sure about its exact mode of action at all times. Pain is often the primary reasons why patients seek dental treatment that you know. Fear, anxiety can cause avoidance, delayment of treatment. That's why you must address these aspects. You've got to be patient, gentle management, reassure the patient. And remember that there have been enormous advantages made in anesthesia analgesia over the last four decades. But there are both physiological, biochemical, and psychological complexities. We've already alluded to those which make the diagnosis and the treatment of pain extremely difficult in some cases. Analgesics make up about half the drugs, 50% prescribed by oral healthcare professionals. The other half are antibiotics. And they are often randomly selected. If you talk to various uh, dental practitioners or health practitioners, they have their personal preference and training of a particular type of nature. Or what did I learn or not learn in dental school? What did they use then? But remember, you've got to keep up with it. New developments take place, and um, you have to be aware of those. But even worse, what did the medical rep of the pharmaceutical company tell me last week? What should I be using? There's a new drug on the market. Is it any better? But they want to sell. They've spent a lot of money in development. They want to put it on the market. But you've got to think carefully. Is it worth it? Often too little attention is paid to matching the treatment to the pain, as well as the patient's physical and psychological state. And all of this may lead to inadequate pain management and encourage self-medication. And this leads to a range of problems. The guy goes away, the lady goes away, and they go and buy some analgesics at the pharmacy or at one of the stores, and they start taking it as they think fit. And this leads to a lot of complications. Believe me, we had a lot of drug overdose problems when I was head of pharmacology 
uh, of people doing exactly that kind of thing. And that is a failure on the side of the, of the oral health practitioners. For most effective treatment of dental pain, it's nature, psychological profile of the patient and all of that must be well understood. For the analgesic that you want to use, get to know them. You should understand the mechanisms of action, the dosage, the contraindications, possible side effects, and the treatment of overdose. Remember, these things are coming up. There are medical legal cases. I was involved in quite a number of these where uh, patients were prescribed the wrong drugs, they developed complications, and then they sue the health practitioner. The history must be taken into account. This is very important these days. We will come to that, particularly also in South Africa, because there is addiction to opiate, opioid analgesics. And the question is always, is the patient uh, faking the pain and are they using you for sustaining his or her drug habit? And that is particularly evident when they start asking you for a particular kind of drug, which they want, which they feel they need. Also take care that your prescription pads are not misappropriated or stolen because this is happening as well. And then people write themselves scripts for their, to sustain their habit on your pad. Tissue injury caused by infective uh, processes or surgery releases bradykinin, histamine, oxidation products of arachidonic acid. We'll show you just now in a picture what that looks like. And these substances are all implicated in the development and inflammation and pain. Particularly prostaglandins E1 and E2 are potent mediators of pain and inflammation in the periphery, and they uh, su support the feelings of pain. These compounds sensitize the nociceptors. These are the pain receptors in the periphery and they enhance hyper, hyperalgesia at the site of injury. So they are actually promoting the development of pain. Prostaglandins, prostaglandins also amplify the pain response and the blood vessel permeability triggered by the bradykinin and histamine. You get plasma extravasation, edema, that's why you get this swelling. This remains much longer than the initial tissue injury. And in particular, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs act on these peripheral and sometimes central pain producing processes. We just look at this uh, schematic representation of the pain cycle there. You have the membrane phospholipids. These are part of the normal cellu cellular membranes. They are damaged. There's an enzyme, uh, phospholipase A2, which converts these phospholipids into arachidonic acid. And this can follow then from arachidonic acid, it can follow either one or two pathways. It can follow the right pathway, the cyclooxygenase pathway, gives you the cyclic endoperoxides, which gives you thromboxanes, prostacyclines, and prostaglandins, or it can go the other way, the lipoxygenase pathway, forming the intermediate 5-HPETE, leukotrienes, leukotriene B4, and cystinol leukotrienes. These compounds which are formed, these final biochemical pronta, cause allergy, inflammation, gastric damage, and in this case, they will cause inflammation, pain, fever, and they also produce gastroprotective prostaglandins. So if we cut that complex, a little bit more complex diagram down, and we look at the arachidonic acid, You've got two types of enzyme pathways. You've got the COX-1 pathway and the COX-2 pathway. The COX-1 pathway, the cyclooxygenase 1 pathway, is what we call the constitutive pathway. This forms prostaglandins, and these prostaglandins produce gastrointestinal cytoproduction, protections, platelet activity, and renal function. That's their, uh, that's their normal function. And then the COX-2 are the inducible um, the inducible enzymes which act on inflammatory stimuli and which produce prostaglandins to cause you inflammation, pain, and fever. From the peripheral site of injury, the pain impulses are transmitted to the central nervous system and modulated en route. So that pain that the patient feels from the tooth is actually felt in the brain. 
in the spinal column at the dorsal horn level, the substance P is released and this activates the spinal pathways to the brain. And sim simultaneously, the sympathetic nervous system is activated and this contributes to the overall emotional response to the pain. The patient crying, the patient being very depressed, that is part of the sympathetic response to the pain. The impulses induced by the noxious stimuli are received via the thalamus, by the cerebral cortex, right in the top of the brain. The action is then taken by release of endogenous neurotransmitters. We'll get to these a little bit more, the endorphins and encephalins. And these endogenous peptides act on the descending neuronal pathways, and therefore they modify or they block the pain responses. The centrally acting analgesics, the opiates and the opioids, work on receptors at various levels in the central nervous system, where these endogenous peptides that we've informed to the encephalins and the endorphins are produced. And the actions of these opioids and opioids, the narcotic analgesics, as they are collectively known, are defined by their activity at mu, kappa, sigma, delta, and epsilon receptors. And the main thing about this, where this differs from the peripheral agents, is that these agents, centrally acting uh, uh, analgesics, have mood-altering effects. And these are directly related to their central mode of action. And therefore, this also enhances their abuse, abuse potential. People feel good. They feel happy when they have this. The pain is suppressed. It works in the brain. It gives us a, a feeling of euphoria. And this makes them very uh, susceptible to abuse. The peripheral acting analgesics, the commonly ones used in dentistry are ASA, that's aspirin, or acetylsalicylic acid, paracetamol, we've alluded to that before, um, uh, ibuprofen, many formulations, uh, naproxen, the role of combinations, of the enzymes within particular codeine. We'll look at that. The interesting thing about acetaminophen, this is data which has come out now fairly recently, is that it seems that if uh, mothers have abused uh, paracetamol over longer periods of time, it can lead to um, attention deficit uh, uh, hyperactivity uh, disease in, in their children, in their offspring. So that's another reason why one has to be careful and not play around with uh, these analgesics unnecessarily. Other non steroidals used in dentistry are paroxicam, rogesic. The trade names are always in caps with the uh, little R, meaning it's a registered trademark listed there, ketoprofen, ketoflam, diclofenac, voltaren, one of the older ones, an excellent uh, drug to use and Lornoxicon, ZFO. It has also been shown that pre-anesthetic administration of Lornoxicam, ZFO, significantly increases the efficacy of inferior alveolar blocks. So if you're going to do surgical procedures or something of the like uh, in the alveolar region, uh, inferior alveolar uh, region, and you're going to give a block, uh, it's maybe a good idea to give them some Lornoxicam before you do the procedure. I just want to show you what things look like. This is a, a picture which my son brought from uh, the USA on, on one of his recent visits. And this is typical. This is only in the US of A. That's a supermarket in Los Angeles. And they are selling ibuprofen tablets. We refer to that in boxes of or bottles of a, of a thousand tablets. Now you can imagine, uh, what does this say? The number of headaches, backaches, toothaches, hangovers, menstrual pains, Etc. per family in the USA must be humongous if this is the kind of thing which they are buying in the supermarkets. The non-steroidals have multiple mechanisms of action. Most of them impair the prostaglandin synthesis. We showed that before in those schemes that I showed you. They impair the prostaglandin synthesis from alkadonic acid and they inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme which by the way is acetylated by aspirin. And this cyclooxygenase enzyme, I showed this before, has two isoenzymes, the cyclooxygenase 1, COX-1, and the cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2. 
Now, the COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors are the conventional non-steroidals, the drugs such as diclofenac, and ibuprofen. They all inhibit COX-1 plus COX-2. But in more recent years, they have become available the so-called COX-2 specific inhibitors. These are the newer non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and they're also known by the name of COXs. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about them in a moment. There are the trade names, Celebrex, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams. These are COX-2 specific inhibitors. They only inhibit the one side of that, of that uh, inflammatory cascade. Giving a non-steroidal inflammatory drug decreases inflammation and consequently hyperalgesia and edema are minimized. And that is one of the main uh, ways of modes of action that the non-steroidals work. The absorption distribution factors may delay the onset of non-steroidals. Uh, that's why I said uh, pre- and perioperative administration, intravenous, rectal, transdermal, intranasal may be advantageous, but it depends on the half-life of the drug. If the drug acts quickly, then you can use it like that just before. Uh, but it's advantageous if you're going to do a painful procedure to give some analgesia in advance. Then by that time, the drug will have been absorbed, you'll have adequate blood levels, and it will be suppressing the pain of that patient uh, during and after the operative procedure. Remember, there's a ceiling analgenic dose for non steroids of which no advantageous pain relieving. You cannot keep on increasing the dose because you will reach a point where increasing the dose is not going to give you more pain relief, but all that's going to happen is there are going to be more side effects. non steroidals alone are not effective for severe pain. You will have to do something more than that. They are generally well toler tolerated, particularly the short acting ones, but remember there's gastrointestinal irritation up to 30% of people have uh, irritation of their, of their stomach mucosa, and they cause about uh, 16,000 deaths per year in the US. People overdosing, developing gastric ulcers, also starting to bleed, and so on. The perforations, ulcers, and bleeds, we call them pubs, uh, and that's got nothing to do with the uh, pubs that we normally think of, and they are not affected by lockdown particularly in patients over 60 years, previous suicides and the co-committant use or concomitant use of corticosteroids, they all lead to the stomach ulcerations and bleeds. Asthmatics, 10 to 20% are sensitive towards aspirin and other non-steroidals. There can be cod adverse cardiac effects. Uh, naproxen sodium seems to be the safest one if there is a cardiac problem you can get other allergic responses. And there are ways and means of combating these as well. You can add some misoprostol or you can add some omeprazole. These are all drugs uh, which help to stabilize the gastrointestinal mucosa and to limit the damage caused by the non plant. Renal toxicity can be a problem. Um, antagonistic effect with respect to antihypertensive medications, people using drugs to keep their blood pressure down, and you can get uh, interactions with that with non steroidals, but you can also get interactions with warfarin, the anticoagulant drug, lithium, antidepressant, ginkgo, St. John's Wort, Anika, et cetera, et cetera. All these uh, weird and wonderful drugs that are used in the outside of the medical field. The half-life and duration of action can be very, very widely. The, the treatment of acute pain, time to onset, uh, peak effects are more critical than the actual duration because you can always make up for duration by increasing the, um, or decreasing the dosage interval. Therapeutic indexes are usually high, but not always. You've got to be careful, particularly with the long-acting ones, such as perhaps and of course, they are low schedule, uh, they schedule two and three, so they're really easy to prescribe. You don't have to uh, fill in all sorts of special forms like you have to do with the opiates. The COX-1 protects the lining of the stomach. And the COX-2 is responsible for triggering pain and inflammation. Now, 
Uh, the COX-2 inhibitors, these newer COX inhibitors, or COXs exhibit analgesic and anti-inflammatory effects. They cause less gastric injury. It's not lacking. They still cause gastric injury, but maybe not as much. But this aspect is often overplayed by the pharmaceutical companies. The reps will come and tell you, you must use Cerebrix, you must use this, you must use that, because they have less um, gastric effects. And that is not the case. They have some renal effects, they have some fewer effects on blood platelets, but they, these coxes may have another downside. They have adverse cardiovascular effects, similar to the conventional non -steroidal. So um, you have to be careful of all of that, all this sales talk. We hear a lot about that these days. Examples of the uh, coxips, the COX-2 inhibitors are Celecoxips, Celebrex, Mobic. They have been evaluated for dental pain relief. They work. There's no problem with that, but we need more studies. The short courses in dentistry, uh, we don't normally give drugs for long periods of time and just for a couple of days. And then you must ask yourself the question, is the higher cost of these COX inhibitors justified? They're expensive compared to the normal non steroidal anti inflammatories. And uh, is this all worth it? And then there are the safety concerns. We spoke about that a moment ago. The centrally acting ones, I have to go a bit faster. We're we, uh, running a bit out of time. They alter the brain's perception. They act on the endogenic peptides, which um, act on these receptors. There are opiates, opioids, and there are different types of these agonists, agonists, antagonists, and partial agonists. We won't go into too much detail there. It's not all that important here. But they have side effects, drowsiness, dizziness, all the rest of it. You can read that. Big problems with, nuns, with the opiates are the respiratory depression. Patients stop breathing when they find uh, drug addicts. Uh, when they find them uh, dead, they often die as a result of uh, stopping breath. We'll talk about that in a moment. Constipation. And of course, the big thing is dependence. People get hooked on these and they want more and more and more. You don't normally use opiates and opioids for, for, for pain, dentally pain. And the examples there, they are at the bottom there. And uh, Polexit Pentadol, this is a new one that's hit the market also in South Africa. And my good friend, Elliot Hirsch at uh, Philadelphia in the US of A, he did a study on Pentadol. And of course it works, but the question is again, do we need this? The combination of analgesics, a fixed doses, popular combinations of aspirin, paracetamol, combined with codeine FOS, and plenty of examples. You can read them there. The problem is that the codeine phosphate content is on the low side. It's normally about eight to 10 milligrams per tablet year. Uh, so for two tablets, it gives you 16 to 20. Well, the studies have shown that you normally want about 30 to 60 milligrams. Uh, they have these in the US, but not here. Uh, that's, that, that is one uh, negative remark. And then they add other things, antihistamines, macrovamate, co caffeine, and all the rest of it. There was a good drug on the market, Doctol. Uh, I think it didn't sell well enough. It contained some paracetamol, codeine phosphate, and then some caffeine. Um, it's, caffeine is a good uh, adjuvant to use for pain relief. So keep the following in mind, flexible management based on the level of pain. Think of the pain ladder, I'll show you that. The age, systemic disease, patient have other diseases, the drug use, abuse, culture, treatment preferences, that should all be considered. And for moderate to mild, mild to moderate pain, the non-steroidals have been shown to be better and paracetamol and codeine. So you're always on the safe side as far as the addictive part is concerned, but there are the other side effects which you must also keep in mind. Be cautious to use opiates and opioids in patients who are addiction prone. Get their history, have a look at them, look at their arms, have a quick look, look for injection marks, and then tramadol may be considered as an opiate if it's necessary. So regular dosing is paramount, a long clock setting, it's important. If you tell a patient, take one tablet every 
four hours or eight hours, set your clock at night to make sure that you keep this level of drug in the body there because this counteracts the establishment of a pain cycle. The nice thing about some doses such as ibuprofen is a good example. You can increase the dose up to 60, 100 milligrams per day and still not suffer too many side effects. Weigh the analgesic efficacy against the undesirable side effects and if necessary, scale up to a more potent analgesic, the pain ladder. Here's a picture of the pain ladder for the uh, sake of time. I'm not going to dwell on it too long. It's self-explanatory. This is where you start step one, you work up to step two, you work up to step three if necessary. And then in hopefully in the process, you look at the pain scale interpretation. Uh, the pain scale is uh, normally runs from zero to 10. And uh, you, you, can, you can form some sort of judgment of where you should be slotting in with your analgesia. The global misuse of prescription over-the-counter opioid analgesics, including, including those containing coding, is a big uh, public health issue. Uh, Dara and colleagues, they uh, produced a good paper in 2015. I haven't seen anything since, but there might have been some more. Opioid analgesics are a pathway to heroin. Codeine is the most commonly consumed opiate analgesic in the world. This codeine that we have been talking about is very popular. 15% of South Africans have a drug problem. That's a major problem, twice the world norm, and it's also underreported. So we are really uh, a nation of one of the highest consumers of codeine in the world compared to oxycodone in the USA. The importation of codeine increased by 50% between 2009 and 2014. Uh, a lot of our drugs are coming in illegally. We'll talk about that in a moment. And South Africa is one of the few countries where you can buy o OTC over-the-counter sale of codeine, where this is allowed. Most of the other countries in the world, you have to have a prescription for a codeine-containing compound. The opioid endemic, epidemic in the USA is the worst crisis in American history. Approximately the same number of deaths as motor vehicle accidents, about 2 million drug abusers in the USA. Main reasons for the use, pain, reward, pressure, we spoke about that, the effects of the opiates on the central nervous system. There's also abuse of a very potent synthetic opioid analgesic such as fentanyl, and then there's the role of the so-called dark or the deep web where one can order these things without being traced. This is a big problem. And you can see how the drug deaths have increased over the years in the US of A. Here they are. This is what we have in South Africa. You can look at the picture later again, but these all contain codeine phosphate. They work centrally on neurons. There are receptors where they work. I'm not going to dwell on this too long. You can look at it, but uh, it has to do with impulse transmission in the brain. And there are opioid receptors and the opioids latch onto these receptors into the, into the brain and they cause all sorts of reactions there. The sites of the action of the opioids, uh, they work, they cause analgesia via the central nervous system. They give these euphoric feelings on demand, also known as the rush. The drug addicts will tell you about that rush when they inject the high, the long-term effects and dependence. And they also reinforce uh, the use of alcohol. So uh, you also find a high percentage of these abusers using alcohol. The opioid epidemic uh, in South Africa, you've got the medical chronicle there. It's killed hundreds of thousands over the past decades. They went as far as introducing the Opioid Crisis Response Act in 2018, but it doesn't match the full scale of the crisis. Codeine and tramadol are abused in Africa. And then, of course, we have our own brands here, known as Niopi, or also known as Wunga. And that is a combination of heroin combined with Dacha, which is plentiful, of course, in South Africa. That is bad stuff and uh, a lot of addiction as a result. 
Buprenorphine is used in opioid substitution treatment. It works well. Uh, they started using this in France, but uh, it's costly. It's very expensive. It's a synthetic opioid, and you can wean people off opioids using that drug. These are the products in South Africa that all contain uh, codeine. You can see the concentrations vary, 8, 10, uh, 10, 10, usually 10. Atkosinol there has 15 milligrams per tablet, so that's a bit higher, but there's the list of drugs. Upscheduling of coding is a possibility, but this would be detrimental to responsible patients. We all use some uh, coding containing compounds from time to time, but we use them responsibly. And then if you upscale it or you upschedule it, then you would have to consult with a doctor or for a prescription for minor complaints. This uh, is gonna take time, it costs money. To avoid the upscheduling, the coding care initiative was being invoked in 2013. And it goes further than um, enforcing the existing regulations, which are ineffective anyway. But there's this issue of pharmacy hopping. The druggies go to, uh, all different kinds of pharmacies and purchasing records are only kept at the pharmacy where the over-the-counter was purchased. So this remains a big problem. People going from one pharmacy to the other to sustain their drug habit. The Coding Care Initiative involves the creation of a national computerized database, but this database is not in existence. Who It has to be created. And who is going to pay for that? The role of the drug companies in the US, uh, Johnson & Johnson, oh, I've heard their name so many times, the last few work, Purdue Pharma, they've all been blamed and fined for helping to cause the epidemic. They've been very aggressive in their marketing of opioid analgesics. The idea of the Coding Care Initiative is to provide an ID, passport number, and address. Sounds, does this sound familiar? And although it has been invoked and initially showed some promise, it doesn't seem to have the buy-in from the retail pharmacies and our laws are weak and the law enforcement in South Africa is weak and it's a very difficult thing to handle here. So what do we do next? We should find a way of keeping checks on over-the-counter preps for coding containing products in South Africa, our biggest drug problem. But it cannot be business as usual because these medications have become too easy to purchase in large quantities. It hasn't hit the scene here yet, but in Russia, I've seen this, I've heard this, and I've actually seen patients in hospitals there where they make a drug which they call crocodile. And they call it crocodile. It has a relationship to the crocodile because when they inject this drug, it literally eats away the tissue. And the reason for that is they extract the codeine phosphate from the drugs with petrol, iodine, paint thinners, lighter fluid, industrial cleaning oils, et cetera, et cetera. And all this rubbish gets injected into the veins. The veins start to deteriorate and it destroys the tissue surrounding the veins. Unfortunately, this young girl, uh, the only alternative was to amputate the arm. And that is often the end result of all of that. So in South Africa, without addressing the situation immediately, the only dependable option will be to reschedule codeine as a prescription of only medicine for our pill popping nation. So we have to do something about it. Otherwise, we're going to lose our easy access to and our responsible access to codeine phosphate. SAFRA is the South African Health uh, Products Regulatory Authority. It was announced by the state president in 2017. It was there. Uh, I was on the old MCC, the Medicines Control Council, for 12 years. We okayed drugs for the market in South Africa, but they decided to replace the old MCC to improve the efficient handling of applications for drug registration, which at the time were lagging behind by about four years. After companies submitted the literature to the uh, Medicines Control Council, it took about four years before the approval was given. But so far, not much progress is made. It seems like a story of more of the MCC and impossible backlogs. 
in registering and keeping quality checks on medicines. There's urgency to get a house in order because both drug abuse and the use of fake drugs in the whole of Africa are rife. Thank you for your attention. Any questions, comments, contributions, concerns from your side? All right. Thank you, Prof. Let me just, okay, there we go. Thank you so much for that lecture, Prof. Uh, it was very insightful. Um, I do have two questions here. Uh, we'll start with the one from our an anonymous attendee. Please comment on lentogesic and why it was discontinued. So the other name is dextropropoxyphene. Yes. Yes, the dextropropoxyphene uh, was one of the older synthetic uh, opioid drugs that was available on the market in South Africa. Um, um, it has been superseded by better drugs such as tramadol, for instance. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, more people were abusing uh, lentogesic than were actually getting uh, therapeutic beneficial effects from it. So the sales went down and this you have to look at very carefully always with the pharmaceutical companies. They will only sell a product on the market if it brings in profits. So lentogesic fell into disfavor and it was decided that there were more side effects than beneficial effects. It wasn't worth it anymore. So it was withdrawn from the market. Okay. All right, we do have more questions. Um, another an anonymous attendee. How would a clinician know what the best dose or dosage to prescribe for when using analgesia and NZs regarding to dental pain? Well, there's, uh, there, there is, I, I want to ref, uh, refer you to the, uh, to the medicines formulary. You should have one of those, or you should have access to one of those. That lists all the drugs that are available in South Africa. There's more info in the um, in, in in that booklet than what there. I've got it on the on the front page of this lecture. There's a picture of it. Um, there's more info there than what there is in MIMS. That's number mm -hmm. one. So if you don't have one, share one with a colleague or uh, mm -hmm. something of the like. And uh, I happen to know my wife works for the South African Medical Association. It is becoming online uh, as from next year. So there will be online subscriptions to it. So again, if you don't have it, you can share. So you can look in there for uh, the correct doses. When it comes to pain, uh, dental pain, you have to form your judgment. You have to look at that pain ladder, which I suggested, and choose something which you normally use. A, a good non is a good place to start if there are no contraindications. And a good one to use is, is always to think of is ibuprofen. And you can start off with 200 milligrams every six to eight hours. You can increase that if the patient phones you and says, I'm still in pain to 400. You can increase that to 600. And if necessary, you can even increase that to 800 uh, milligrams per 24 hours. Um, and normally uh, that should help. If it doesn't, then you have to start looking for other reasons why the pain is continuing. Thank you. Uh, another question from Gerda Howard. What do you prescribe for someone with a stomach ulcer? Uh, first of all, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are then what we call relatively contraindicated. If that patient tells you that he or she had a stomach ulcer two years ago, um, he or she was treated and it was healed successfully. They did endoscopy and all the rest of it. Uh, I think for a, a couple of days, you can um, quite safely give that patient a non steroidal such as ibuprofen. If, however, the patient had this ulcer recently, I would say a couple of months ago, or is currently having an active ulcer, I would stay away from the non steroidals and I would go for a combination uh, uh, a drug containing um, paracetamol and codeine phosphate. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we just have three more questions. Another one from an anonymous attendee. Is Sankadol still available in South Africa? Sorry? Is Sankadol. Sankadol. 
Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't think so. I haven't seen Sun Coden for a long time now. Uh, but then again, uh, there are so many uh, alternatives available that, um, you know, um, you shouldn't have a problem choosing another analgesic if, if, that, is what is, if that is what the question is aiming at. But, but as I say, the companies, uh, they, they take drugs off the market uh, because they don't sell sufficient for them to make enough profit, and then it just disappears. Okay. Lovely. Um, another question from another anonymous attendee. Where can we do more uh, pharmaceutical courses specifically for dentists? You have to invite me more regularly. <laughs> I'm sure that can. <laughs> um, well, well a, a formal course, you know, I mean, at, at the pharmacology, at, at the medical school, they often have honours uh, courses in pharmacology, which are uh, the honours course that, that we always presented was a very popular one and a very good course. It was a two-year part-time course. So, but that is if you uh, have a particular interest in pharmacology. But if you want to know more about it for, uh, for, for, for dental purposes, yes, you have, to, you have to get more of the CPD courses. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, Prof, are ibuprofens contraindicated in hypertensive patients? Again, uh, my question to that would be, it would be a relative contraindication, in my opinion. Uh, you, a patient that has hyper, what, what is hypertension? You know, and you can ask these questions to my son, who is a, a heart specialist, cardiologist, who's going to give the next talk. Uh, and, and you can test his opinion on that as well. But what I would <laughs> say is if the hypertension is well controlled, in other words, it's not over the top, uh, either the systolic or the diastolic blood pressures. And of course, I just want to remind you that as dentists, it is now incumbent upon you to measure blood pressure. You get these automated blood pressure meters. And if anything ever goes wrong, uh, you're going to have a hard time explaining why you didn't check that. Yes, I would say if the blood pressure is uh, well controlled, a few days of ibuprofen is not going to make the world's difference. But if it is a label blood pressure, if it's not well controlled, then I would again steer clear from it. And I would rather go to a combination drug for pain relief. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from an anonymous attendee. Will the adoption of obligatory electronic scripting not be an effective means to combat pharmacy hopping and abuse of medications? Uh, well, uh, yes, I, I, I think it would, but um, mm -hmm. as, as I have it, I haven't heard anything to, the, uh, to make me very excited that this uh, control prescribing is, is getting off the floor. It's, um, you have to get a buy-in from all the pharmacies, and there are big pharmacy uh, producers outside there. You know, I'm thinking of Click, I'm thinking of Dischem, and, and, and many more of them, and they all have to subscribe to this, and they all have to get onto a centralized system to be able to do this. And uh, we, we're not there yet, not, not, not by a long shot. Yeah, true. All right, and then we have one from Jack Beth um, Whiting or Whitting. I think she does know you. Good morning, Prof. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for your excellent lecture, as always. Two questions. I've had two patients saying tramacet or tramadol doesn't work for them because they don't have the enzyme. Uh, for masseter uh, trismus, um, I hoped to prescribe um, spasmid with an NZ, but couldn't get info on the SAMF on the doses of um, mifenicin. I registered on the MIMS website and they stated only 1.5 to 3 grams per day, but the drug comes in 15 milligram tablets. Would you use uh, mefacine? Um, you had other names in your lecture and what should the dosage be? Well, I, I can only refer you again to the SA Medicines formulary there. If they don't list it there, you can always have a look on the internet, but just be careful that you don't you, you see, there is such a thing as called uh, off-label use of drugs. Mm. Uh, there are uh, 
dental practitioners, medical practitioners who use drugs which were okayed by the medicines control councils for a specific condition. Now you use it for something else, then you are, I won't say acting illegally, but you're taking all the responsibility on your shoulders. If something does go wrong, and 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 don't forget, this is this is many many years later. But uh, this wasn't such a problem a couple of decades ago. But uh, patients are e extremely uh, um, keen these days uh, to to take up legal action against the practitioners, and and yeah. and you want to protect yourself against that all the time. So my advice to you would be is rather stick to something that is indicated for its purpose and, and, and don't go beyond that uh, dosage wise, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can, and I can tell you long stories about this, you know, um, we haven't got time to do that now, but uh, patients who actually sued dentists for, for using drugs on them, which, which they told the dentist in the medical history, uh, they, they get bad reactions from. And they, they've successfully sued, and you, you don't want this to happen. So that is the answer that I can give you at this point. Okay. So we've got questions coming in fast. I'm just going to quickly go through maybe two more before your son has to speak. Um, let's just see. Another anonymous attendee, which painkiller or drug do you give patients on warfarin? Um, I, I, I would I would uh, go for one of the uh, combination drugs there again, and uh, I think that would be that would be safer than using any one of the others. We I just had a chat with my son before we we started off this morning, and and I'm sure he will uh, he will talk to you at some stage about this too. That uh, patients who are on anticoagulation anticoagulation for cardiac valves and that sort of thing, it's it's extremely dangerous to mess around with their profiles by giving drugs or by withholding uh, warfarin or something of, of, of that nature. So um, I, I, I would, if, if I'm uncertain, I would, I would leave out the non-steroidal and I would go for a combination analgesic. Okay. And just one more question so that we just keep time. Um, another anonymous attendee. Uh, Prof suggestions for the first go-to for mild pains with patients that have compromised kidneys um, and patients with uh, mild pain and heart issues. Well, that becomes a complex matter. You know, if, if, um, if, if, there, if, there, if there is a renal failure in some way or another, then you have to get advice uh, as from the patient's physician, uh, preferably the specialist, the nephrologist or something like that, and, and act accordingly. And the same goes for the cardiac problems. Um, uh, and again, your, my son will, will refer to this because these, these things can go south. I had, a, I had a very good friend in the US of A in Los Angeles who was in the same job as I was, a dental pharmacologist, and he advised uh, uh, prophylaxis, uh, antibody prophylaxis for patients with a heart condition. And he, this guy went to his doctor and the doctor said, phoned the dentist and said, no, 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 you, you can't do that. You've got to do as I tell you, I'm the doctor, you're the dentist. And he prescribed something completely different, which was outside of the accepted guidelines. And this patient developed uh, cardiac problems. Uh, he sued the dentist, and in the court case that ensued, which my friend was an expert witness in, the uh, the judge found the dentist guilty and said, "You acted against your own better knowledge, and you have to be very, very careful of that." So, if you are unsure about a patient, you get advice from a specialist in the field of the disease that the patient is suffering from, and get that. Uh, physician or cardiologist or whatever to put down what he advises on paper so that you've got a record and that you're not responsible. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Prof. Um, Thank okay, you. I'm gonna... Pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay, so all right. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Peter van der Beel, who's Prof's son. They do have the same name and surname. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through his CV and then he can start his lecture. 
So Prof. Peter van der Beel earned his medical degree in cum laude in 2005 from Stellenbosch University and in 20, 2007 obtained his diploma in anesthetics. He was admitted in the College of Physicians of South Africa in 2011 as a fellow or specialist physician. In 2014, he qualified with the certificate in cardiology from the College of Physicians of South Africa um, in 2014. In 2015, he received the Boston Scientific R.C. Fraser International Fellowship in Cardiovascular Intervention, uh, enabling him to spend time in the Department of Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery at the highly regarded, um, highly regarded uh, intervention unit of the St. Thomas Hospital in London. After working for a year as a cardiologist in private practice, he embarked on a fellowship in cardiac imaging at Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands under the supervision of the renowned Prof. Jurian J. Bax, which is, who's the director of the non-invasive um, cardiac imaging at Leiden University Medical um, Center and past president of the European Society of Cardiology from 2017 to 2018. The focus of Dr. Peter's uh, research was the role of cardiac imaging in device therapy for heart failure and sudden cardiac death. Okay, I could go on for another seven or eight minutes with the CV. Uh, I think I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Peter van der Beyl and he will start his lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna, speak today to you about um, infective endocarditis and um, particularly about prophylaxis, which of course is extremely important in the uh, dental context. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the background of infective endocarditis, but just to um, refer refresh uh, your memories, basically, Using the term endocarditis um, implies that there's inflammation of the endocardium and it's due to an infective process. And this is usually bacterial, um, but it need not be. It can be fungal and it can even be viral in uh, some cases. So um, using the term infective endocarditis does not imply a specific organism. And just looking back briefly at how endocarditis develops, well, in most cases, you need a substrate. That's not always true, but it's true for the majority of cases. So you need um, some kind of predisposing condition, and um, that can be different things. It can be prosthetic material inside your vascular system, often inside your heart. And, um, the most common of that probably is a prosthetic valve that you can see here on the right-hand side. Um, but it can also be denuded endocardium in the heart, which can be caused by heart lesions. For example, turbulent blood flow um, because of a rheumatic valve. Uh, you can see a rheumatic mitral valve there at the bottom or a congenital heart lesion. And you can also denude endocardium um, by any kind of intervention. Uh, so something like a permanent pacemaker lead in the right heart or a central venous catheter that's been inserted um, that you'll see on the picture. And that I put in the center because in a, in a sense, it's uh, a mix of denuded endocardium and prosthetic material. So it's a foreign object inside your circulation, but it also damages the um, endocardium. So then what happens is your body recognizes um, this is abnormal and essentially starts a blood clot um, either on the prosthetic material or in the area of the denuded endocardium. So thrombocytes will become entangled within a fibrin that's been deposited and you will develop a non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. So it really starts as a non-infective process. And um, at the bottom, you can see a picture uh, of uh, red blood cells that are entangled within a mesh of fibrin. And this really sets the scene for the development of endocarditis. So if you have this nidus of infection, uh, this non-bacterial thrombotic lesion, and you now expose it to bacteremia, so circulation of bacteria in your blood, uh, these bacteria can become entangled in this 
measure of fibrin and red blood cells. And that's really the start um, of a vegetation in infective endocarditis. Now, the question is, how do you get bacteria into your bloodstream? That's not very difficult. And it can be a dental procedure, but it's now being recognized more and more that everyday um, activities also cause this. For example, simply mastication uh, or something uh, like brushing your teeth. So if we are all exposed to transient bacteremias, um, but this will not cause a problem in healthy people. But if you have an underlying predisposition, bacteria can um, deposit on this lesion and then you start uh, the process of infective endocarditis. So the question is, what's the rationale for prevention of endocarditis? And that's really an easy question to answer because it's a very deadly disease. Um, in the pre-antibiotic era, the mortality appears to have been 100%. And even in modern times, uh, when we can treat endocarditis with bacteria, the one-year mortality is 20 to almost 40%. And that's really, that's a very high mortality for an infection in, um, you know, in modern times. So it's really, really a very serious infection, very dangerous disease, and you really want to prevent it if you can. Um, there are some uh, research uh, results from, from animal studies, from preclinical -pre studies that show the effectiveness of antibiotic prophylaxis. However, um, this is not uh, such a cut and dried case. So in green, I've put some reasons why um, you would want to use antibiotics for prophylaxis. And in red, I've put some reasons against. And um, the fact is that it sounds logical to use antibiotic prophylaxis for infective endocarditis before dental procedures. However, in large case control series, um, so not randomized trials, but just large collection of data, um, there's no clear association between a dental procedure and infective endocarditis. And the second thing is that um, the risk is actually very low. So the risk of developing endocarditis after a dental procedure is, is about one in 150,000. So that's very rare. And then against that stand the facts that um, there is a risk, although it's very low, of developing um, a serious unwanted effect from administering simple antibiotics like anaphylaxis. It's never been reported for amoxicillin in the context of infective endocarditis prophylaxis, but it has been reported for clindamycin, for example, although very rare, 13 out of a million cases. And then, of course, there's the issue of resistance. So if you administer antibiotics to people, that you always um, have the risk of, of um, resistance developing. So you want to restrict your use of antibiotics if possible. So at this stage, there are no prospective randomized trials um, with data showing that uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is effective for the prevention of endocarditis in dental procedures. So really all the recommendations are based on expert opinion. And um, the thinking is that prophylaxis should be restricted to the patients at highest risk. So we're gonna discuss this at the hand of um, some guidelines and we'll start with the European Society of Cardiology guidelines on infective endocarditis. And then we'll see what the Americans say and the British. And like I've mentioned, all these guidelines are written by expert committees, but they are mainly consensus based and not based on randomized controlled trials as uh, many other cardiology guidelines are. And then finally, we'll move to the South African Heart Association. Um, it's not a guideline, it's a consensus statement and um, see what the local situation is. So probably the most authoritative document on this is the European Society of Cardiology guideline. It comes from 2015. It's a very comprehensive document. You can download it for free on the internet if you want. Um, it discusses the whole diagnosis and management of endocarditis, not only prophylaxis. So what do they say? Which patients should you uh, give an uh, antibiotic prophylaxis to? And really the thinking is that um, patients at highest risk of adverse outcome, in other words, those where 
you cannot afford um, to develop endocarditis because it will be very serious, it will be a disaster. And those are the following three categories. Any patient with a prosthetic valve, so any patient with a prosthetic heart valve, um, if you develop prosthetic valve endocarditis, it's an extremely serious condition with a very high mortality. Um, I'll give some statistics uh, in one of the next slides. And then you have to perform uh, re-surgery and replace the valve. And that's also very high risk. The second um, group is patients with previous endocarditis. They are at much higher risk of developing endocarditis again. And the third group is patients with congenital heart disease. So any cyanotic congenital heart disease and any um, congenital heart condition where there's prosthetic material placed um, in the heart, either surgically or with a catheter or a device technique. And up to six months after the procedure, um, that's because prosthetic material usually endothelializes and then the risk decreases or lifelong if there's a shunt or any valvular regurgitation that remains. So an uh, important point um, is that if I say prosthetic valves, that also includes um, TAVI valves, so percutaneously placed valves. So these have become much more common for aortic valve replacement um, in the past decade. Um, they're especially used for patients that are too old or too frail to undergo surgical valve replacement. So essentially the valve is rolled up um, on a catheter like a stent and it's placed transfemorally, um, but it's still a prosthetic heart valve. And they're also at risk of um, infective endocarditis. So this is something that you're likely to see more and more often as more of these valves are placed. Um, and you should treat them just like um, any other prosthetic valve. And it's actually even more important to make sure that they receive prophylaxis. Because remember that these patients receive a, this valve because they were too ill or too frail to be operated on in the first instance. So if this valve gets infected, you cannot perform a surgery to replace it like you could potentially still do with a surgically placed valve because these patients are too ill to operate. So really, you only have antibiotic treatment and that is often uh, not effective and then you are really in a dead end road. So if patient says they've had a TAVI, and that's a, in America it's called a TAVI, but in Europe, in Europe called a TAVI valve, uh, treat that like any other prosthetic heart valve. So the question is, what's the, the real rationale be, behind the European Society of Cardiology guidelines? Well, um, the, the experts who write it, they've decided that there's really be, there's, has to be a shift from um, focusing on the procedure to the cumulative effect of a low-grade transient bacteremia. So that's what I mentioned earlier to Cause this is easy um, by mastication, toothbrushing, flossing, using a toothpick that all causes um, transient bacteremia. So it's something that happens in most people probably every day. And um, this causes, this is as much of a risk um, to endocarditis as a dental procedure. So probably it's not the dental procedure itself, it's the underlying risk and that exposes the patient. And so the focus has gone away from the procedure to uh, those patients that are at highest risk because of their underlying lesions. Those are the ones that you want to protect with antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, so I've mentioned this before, why prosthetic material, patients with prosthetic valves or any other prosthetic material in their hearts or vascular systems, well, if that gets infected, they will often, not always, but often require re-surgery. This is high-risk surgery, um, and it is associated with higher mortality and morbidity than, for example, uh, replacing a heart valve for the first time. The second group, those with previous infective on the endocarditis, they have a high risk of recurrence and have a higher morbidity if um, they do develop endocarditis for a second time. And then those with congenital heart disease, like I've mentioned, they already have abnormal hearts and um, circulatory systems that are under stress. And there's a high risk of morbidity and mortality when they do develop endocarditis. And again, if there's prosthetic material that becomes infected, 
uh, doing revision surgery on this might be very complex, very high risk, or even impossible. So these are the patients that cannot afford to develop endocarditis because it will uh, be very serious and a very um, significant consequences. You want to focus on them uh, to provide prophylaxis. So in terms of the procedure, uh, the ESC, they basically um, just reserve this to dental procedures and um, not for uh, local anesthetic injections, um, treatment of superficial caries, removal of sutures, dental x-rays, uh, placement or adjustment of re removal of appliances or braces, etc. So only for dental procedures requiring manipulation of a gingival periapical region of the teeth or perforation of the oral mucosa. So they make a distinction uh, in terms of the kind of dental procedure that might place a patient at risk um, for endocarditis. So just to summarize the uh, rationale, so basically um, prophylaxis is indicated for patients in high risk groups and the ESC indicates three groups. As you remember, prosthetic valves, patients with previous endocarditis and um, congenital heart disease with a bit of detail, but those are the important groups. That's the important message, the three groups of patients who cannot afford to get endocarditis. And if a dental procedure, at risk dental procedure, not any procedure, the one, ones listed in the table, at risk procedure is being performed in any one of these patient groups, then um, you will want to provide prophylaxis. So just briefly, um, what does the ESC recommend in terms of um, prophylaxis regimens? Well, amoxicillin or ampicillin, um, and then as an alternative, uh, clindamycin, and also some first authored generation cephalosporins. So you have quite a wide um, choice. You can give these drugs orally, some intravenously. The patient is unable to take it orally. But it's just important to note the um, subscript to the table that cephalosporin should not be used in patients who have a risk of or, or a history of um, hypersensitivity to penicillin or ampicillin because there is um, an area of overlap uh, of cross sensitivity. So if you um, are allergic to penicillins, um, you, there, there are some patients who will also be at risk of uh, hypersensitivity reactions to cephalosporins. So then rather use something completely different, uh, like clindamycin, which is an acosamide and of a different antibiotic class. And then, of course, there are also some non-pharmacological um, measures to protect these patients in the high-risk groups. And many of these are, um, are, are dental in nature. Um, so, uh, you know, it's important for these patients to generally um, maintain good dental and cutaneous hygiene and to follow up with the dentist twice a year. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list, um, but what's important and, and what, what's important for you to educate patients about is to maintain good dental hygiene and also where it says discourage piercing and tattooing. Uh, that piercing, of course, also includes any uh, oral um, piercing, any tongue piercing, that kind of thing. Um, there's little data to support that, but it, it seems logical that um, that can be a notice of infection and, uh, you know, you want to avoid any kind of uh, nidus of, of bacteremia that will seed bacteria into your bloodstream if you have any of these high-risk conditions, so it's better not to. All right, so <clears throat> let's move on to the American Heart Association guidelines. Um, they're a bit older. They were published in 2007. And in general, they are very similar to the European guidelines. So they, again, identify patients at high risk. And these first three groups are essentially the same. The, the description differs slightly. But prosthetic heart valves, patients with previous endocarditis, and those with congenital heart disease, very similar. But then there's one important difference. So the American guideline adds patients with cardiac transplants who have valvulopathy. So any patient who's had a heart transplant and has developed a 
valve lesion, any kind of valve lesion, stenosis, incompetence, any cardiac valve, they don't specify. Um, they also think that these patients are at uh, high risk. In other words, it's another group that you don't want to uh, expose to the risk of infective endocarditis. If you develop infective endocarditis um, in a transplanted heart, again, that's a big problem, difficult to rectify. So um, that's the fourth group, and that's really the only important difference to the ESC uh, guideline. They'll see a heart being prepared for transplant. And again, this table where they um, discuss the type of dental procedure where prophylaxis is indicated. I'm not going to read the whole table. You'll see it's very, very similar to the European guideline. It's almost identical. Um, the regimens are also similar. The only real difference is that they also um, advise azithromycin as, um, uh, as an alternative in patients who are able to take oral medication. But in general, we're not going to cover the whole table. If you compare it to the ESC guideline, it's actually pretty similar. The other interesting thing is they give a few uh, practical aspects um, and these do not appear in the European guidelines, so I've put them on a separate slide. Already mentioned the azithromycin for uh, patients who are hypersensitive to penicillin but are able to take oral antibiotics. What they advise uh, also is that you should choose a different class of antibiotic, in, in other words, not a penicillin, in patients who are receiving prophylaxis, long term prophylaxis for rheumatic heart disease. Um, and this is something that you might encounter in South Africa a bit more commonly because rheumatic bowel disease is still fairly common. And some of these patients are long-term penicillin prophylaxis, um, some into their early 40s. Um, in other words, they are chronically exposed to penicillin. And if you want to uh, provide some additional um, infective endocarditis prophylaxis, you have to choose an antibiotic from a different class. So that's an important point. And um, it's particularly relevant for our local conditions. The other important point is that um, if you want to provide infective endocarditis prophylaxis to a patient who's recently completed a course of antibiotics for uh, any other infections, anything unrelated, bronchitis or a urinary tract infection, you um, should ideally wait 10 days. So if it's an elective procedure, rather wait 10 days um, and then give your standard prophylaxis. Avoid intramuscular injections in patients who are anticoagulated. Um, I mean, that's not an absolute contra uh, indication, but it's a, a good rule of thumb because, of course, they are at risk of developing a, uh, a subcutaneous hematoma if you do inject anything intramuscularly into them. And then um, it says when you are providing prophylaxis for prosthetic valves or um, congenital heart disease patients with prosthetic material, these cases of endocarditis are often caused by Staphylococcus aureus and not by the usual oral um, streptococci. And you might want to use a first generation cephalosporin um, and uh, tailored to local susceptibility data. So it's not a must, but it's just an, an aside. Um, so that's for, for patients in basically the first and the third group. And then they say that uh, patients should have a dental evaluation before valve surgery or congenital heart surgery, which of course is also a good idea. Then finally, we'll look at the uh, British Society for Antimicrobial um, Chemotherapy recommendations. That's also, um, it's even a bit older than the AHA. It comes from 2006. And again, you will see these now hopefully uh, already very familiar three groups, previous infective endocarditis, just the sequence has changed. It's number two in the ESC and AHA guidelines and then previous cardiac valve replacement and um, any surgically constructed or pulmonary shunt of conduit, which is very similar to the congenital um, heart disease statement, although it's a bit more, well, it's not exactly the same. It's a bit more restricted in other words, it doesn't say, for example, for any 
um, cyanotic congenital heart condition. So if you're a patient with a cyanotic congenital heart condition without a surgical um, conduit or, or, a, um, or a shunt, then uh, under these guidelines, the patient would not get prophylaxis, but I would advise uh, a yes in that case. And the other thing is here, they don't restrict the prosthetic material to congenital heart conditions. So if you have something else, um, you know, intravascular um, prosthetic material um, in a patient where um, that, that that's, does not have a congenital heart condition, it's also, um, you know, sort of subsumed in this recommendation. And I think that's an important point, for example, um, if you have a patient with a left ventricular assist device, so it's, it's not exactly what's on the picture down there, but it's similar. So a patient with severe heart failure who cannot get a transplant for some reason, but now has a pump uh, basically implanted inside the heart um, to assist that heart uh, with severe heart failure. That's also a lot of prosthetic material that, that's exposed to your vascular system. And it's not really, um, strictly speaking, congenital. It it's, it's, can be for acquired um, heart disease. So there's prosthetic material inside the heart. It's not a valve and it's not congenital. Um, if you ask me, would I give prophylaxis to someone like that? I would say yes, because for me, it's very similar to the other conditions. So that's not specifically addressed, but I think it's an important uh, point of difference with the British guideline. And then what they also advise is that these high-risk patients um, that you can provide them with a, um, a mouth rinse for a minute uh, with some chlorhexidine, which um, is not, again, supported by any um, strong data, but one could probably argue, well, um, it probably has a very low risk, so why not? Um, if it decreases the bacterial load before the procedure, then it's probably uh, something that one can consider. These guidelines still advise prophylaxis for um, gastrointestinal and surgical procedures, but this is really an outdated idea and it's not included in the um, AHA guideline. It's not included in the ESC guideline. And I think um, really we've moved away from that. That's outdated. Um, again, the regimen's very similar, also including azithromycin, um, like um, the American guidelines but it's a little bit different. And what's different is that they recommend azithromycin syrup in patients who are penicillin allergic but unable to swallow tablets. So um, that's an option if you want to avoid intravenous administration of antibiotics. The patient can, for some reason, not swallow a tablet or a capsule. You can um, provide them with a syrup, and I think it's not a bad alternative. This is not uh, mentioned in any other uh, guideline but it's something that you can consider as an alternative. Um, then two minor differences from the other guidelines, they recommend categories of mass for children, not per kilogram. That's a very small um, difference, just the table. So they also have a section on practical aspects. And um, again, they, they focus on maintaining good oral hygiene and then using a chlorhexidine mouthwash, as I've already mentioned, which is probably not a bad idea, and it's not mentioned in any of the other guidelines. And they recommend an interval of 14 days between sequential um, procedures, which is um, very similar, really, to the AHA recommendation of 10 days if the patient has had a previous course of antibiotics. So if you cannot delay, then use an alternative um, antibiotic. If you cannot wait 10 to 14 days before performing the next procedure, all right, and then finally, we'll have a look at what the South African Heart Association says. So this is not a complete guideline, um, but it's a position statement that was published in 2017, so it's a bit more brief. And it's really based on the ESC guideline because the South African Heart Association is aligned with the European Society of Cardiology. It's our um, main international um, uh, sort of collaborator and the South African Heart Association also automatically um, assumes ESC guidelines unless there is a, a, a guideline or a position statement to, that's uh, specifically written by SA Heart or 
um, modifies the recommendation from the EC guidelines. And this is not true and just for infective endocarditis, it's true for all the um, ESC guidelines on different cardiac conditions. So really it's, it's identical to the ESC guideline, but there's one big difference. The South African Heart Association position statement recommends infective endocarditis prophylaxis for rheumatic heart disease, which is not in the ESC guideline, it's not in the AHA guideline. So here you see a mitral valve that's been um, affected by um, uh, rheumatic um, heart disease, the same picture as I showed um, at the uh, one of the very first slides where we discussed the pathophysiology. The regimens we're not going to um, review because it's uh, absolutely identical to the ESC one. Um, but the question is why is it recommended that traumatic heart disease is um, uh, also included as a condition for prophylaxis? Well, the, there is some data to show that the prognosis is poor if you develop endocarditis on a rheumatic valve. Um, and it's very common um, in South Africa. It's much more common than in Europe and the United States. It used to be common there, but it, the incidence has dropped considerably um, during the 20th century. So these European and American guidelines do not include rheumatic valve disease any longer because um, Although the prognosis, prognosis isn't great if you develop endocarditis, you can treat it with antibiotics and you can replace the NATO valve. Um, so that's their rationale. But the South African Heart Association feels that probably um, access to heart surgery is not always so easy in South Africa. Um, and it's a much more common condition. So um, they have maintain the recommendation that uh, rheumatic valve should be included on the list of patients who get prophylaxis. They also make mention of patients with HIV or AIDS, and there's no clear association with infective endocarditis, so just um, to know about that. And then they make a statement about poor oral health care um, in the developing world, and that also um, drops the threshold for prophylaxis a little bit in terms of rheumatic valves. So what is a practical approach? Um, follow the guidelines. So follow the South African Heart Association guideline. In other words, it's the ESC guideline, but including rheumatic valves. This is also important medically legally. If you don't follow the guidelines, you will expose yourself to possible litigation. Um, educate patients about good oral health care and about um, jewelry, uh, like, a, like a tongue stud. Take a history, document um, what you find in the history. If you're unsure, consult with a colleague, another dentist or a cardiologist. Um, take the patient's preference into consideration. If the patient wants prophylaxis and it's not in the guideline, um, you can consider giving it. And take written informed consent if you're going to administer um, prophylaxis. I'm briefly going to mention... Um, the NICE guidelines, um, they were published um, more recently than the others, but I don't want to focus your attention on this because they recommend no prophylaxis for dental procedures um, because, you know, the association is not so clear. But this is, is risky. It's not universally accepted. It differs from all the other main guidelines. And I, I would not recommend that you follow this guideline, even though it's... Um, it's been you know, formally accepted and published in the UK. So the guidelines changed and became much more restrictive in the sort of mid, late 2000s. So all these guidelines I've mentioned are much more restrictive in their indications for um, endocarditis prophylaxis than previous guidelines. Um, and there have been some studies, there are many more than this I've just you know, uh, re uh, referenced for, to see what has actually happened since the guidelines have changed? Um, because as I've mentioned now more than once, the guidelines are mainly based on expert opinion and not on, on randomized trials. So there is, of course, a chance that the, you know, these recommendations are actually wrong and don't work in practice. Um, and you'll see, uh, like this guy on the picture, we're all a bit confused because the message isn't all that clear. Most studies have shown no increase in infective endocarditis, or at least 
non-streptococcal infective endocarditis after a change in the guidelines. But there are some studies like um, this, like Dyer and co-workers in Lancet 2015, um, where they did show an increase in infective endocarditis after the guidelines have changed. So the message, the message isn't 100% clear, but it, it does appear like the preponderance of evidence um, suggests that there's no increase in infective endocarditis after the guidelines have become more restrictive. So doesn't, there aren't any alarm bells. So to summarize, um, antibiotic prophylaxis and infective endocarditis is indicated for dental procedures in the table and in high-risk patients, in other words, patients who cannot afford to develop endocarditis, those remain prosthetic valves, previous infective endocarditis, congenital heart lesions, especially those with prosthetic valve material and cyanotic congenital heart conditions, and rheumatic valves, as I mentioned in the South African guideline. Um, what do you need to do in practice? Implement these guidelines, play it safe, follow the SA heart guideline and add the congenital, uh, sorry, the, the rheumatic um, uh, valve patients, inform the patient properly and take written consent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter van der Beyl. Um, I'm going to just head over to our Q&A and just get some questions. Um, and then you can just um, answer some of them for us. Let's just see what we've got here. Okay, um, anonymous attendee asked, in South Africa, do we always have to prescribe antibiotic prophylaxis when needing to perform dental treatment? And I think you have sort of answered this question. Um, so, well, the answer is, is not just yes. I mean, you need to look at the kind of dental procedure and um, you will understand that better than what I do. But if you, if you refer back to that ESC um, table, it's not any dental procedure. It, these are sp specific procedures. I'm just going to um, go back to that table to uh, refresh your memory to this one. Um, so dental procedures requiring manipulation of the gingival or periapical region of the teeth or perforation of the oral mucosa. The prophylaxis is um, recommended for these procedures and not for all the others listed below. Um, I think those are just examples. I mean, so any other procedure you do that does not fit into the first um, category do not specifically require prophylaxis. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's just get another question. Um, another one from anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the best or acceptable dose or dosage or dosage of antibiotic prophylaxis when prescribing in a case when a patient is allergic to penicillin and clindamycin is not available? All right, so <clears throat> let's have a look at the um, again, at the ESC regimens. So you said the question is if the patient's allergic to penicillin or ampicillin. Yes. So not here. And clindamycin is not available. So this is out as well. Then we move okay. to this third category. So you can use a first or a third generation cephalosporin, cephalexin, kefazolin, keftriaxan. And the doses are also mentioned here, two grams intravenously for adults. 50 milligrams per kilogram intravenously for children. And uh, it's, sorry, it's behind the arrow, but it's a one gram uh, intravenously for adults or 50 milligrams per kilogram intravenously for children for uh, these drugs. So that's what's recommended. And, um, kef uh, and, and, and cef these cephalosporins are fairly uh, widely available. So it shouldn't be a problem to get all of them. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question from anonymous attendee. Is prophylaxis regimens for patients with other prosthesis, i.e. hip replacement, the same as for heart conditions? No, uh, it's not. And the reason is that um, there might be a risk and it, uh, uh, but I think that the, the rationale is like this. So firstly, something like a hip prosthesis is not 
nearly as directly exposed to the bacteremia as a, um, anything intravascularly. So of course, any joint or anything is also perfused and there is, there is blood flow. So bacteria can potentially um, reach a, a non-cardiac or a non-vascular prosthesis, but it's a bit less exposed than something that's intravascular like a heart valve, which is literally inside the blood flow of your body all the time. And secondly, if, if you were to develop an infection on a non-cardiac or a non-vascular prosthesis, it might be serious, but it's not as life-threatening. I mean, if you really have to revise or replace um, uh, um, a replacement arthroplasty, that's possible um, in most cases without endangering the patient's life. But if you have heart failure and you've had previous cardiac surgery and now you have an infected prosthetic valve, that is a, a life-threatening um, condition. Uh, you cannot chance that. So the risk is a bit different and the implications are also a bit different. And so prophylaxis is not recommended for something like that any longer. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from uh, Shea Pele. I'd like to know what happens when a patient presents with deep supra and subgingival calculus or NUH and needs a deep growth scaling and uh, follow up appointments for completion of treatments. Well, that's a very dental question. So I don't know how, <laughs> if I'm really um, uh, comfortable in answering that, but if we just, sorry, if I just can go back again, refer you to the slide, I would think that the kind of procedure you describe is, is um, you know, certainly encompassed by this first description. So if you're going to um, deep D scale, that will, you will certainly be manipulating the gingival tissue uh, mm, the oral mucosa. So I think it's definitely going to fall um, under this category. So I think the answer will be yes. Okay, all right. And uh, Brian Olifir um, asked, does the presence of cardiac stents constitute a high risk um, for uh, infective endocarditis? No, it does not. Um, and there are, well, th there are two aspects to this. So the first is that um, stents are covered by endothelium in the first few months. So as soon as, a, as a, any cardiac prosthesis or anything is covered by um, endothelium, it's no longer a risk for endocarditis because it's not exposed to the bloodstream any longer. However, if you look at, for example, the congenital um, part of, of the guideline, it'll say up to the first six months. So one could argue, well, should should you not provide prophylaxis then to patients with stents for the first six months before the stents have been covered with endothelium. But for some reason that I don't think is all that well understood, stent infection is exceedingly rare. If I remember correctly, I think there have been 50 cases reported ever, and there are millions of stents being placed worldwide every year. So infection of a stent is not impossible, but it is extremely rare. And therefore it's not included um, in the guideline. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Bianca Mohandala. Do you think there's a gap in emphasizing the importance of good oral health in patients with cardiac problems from the cardi cardiologist to the dentist and oral hygienist? Um, I think, Yes, I think there is. Um, I mean, we all tend to focus on what we're comfortable with and what we, uh, you know, what we know best, and we're all in a hurry. Um, mm. But I think this is important. Um, although one should, you know, maintain balance. There, you know, there was a, a trend um, years ago where basically every patient who was scheduled for a heart valve replacement was automatically referred to a dentist with. Um, really with the uh, request to extract all teeth. And, um, you know, that might sound strange, but that, that really is something that, you know, was quite commonly seen. And I think that's, you know, very extreme. That's not, not um, called for. However, I think um, it's something that, that's not emphasized enough. And um, as you will see, it's, it's in the AHA and the British guideline. It's also in one of the slides. If you are planning a procedure, major cardiac procedure on a patient, like a valve replacement, 
it's always a good idea to get a dental opinion first because once the valve is in, um, really that's, you know, that's not too late, but, it, you know, you, you want to treat any, um, you know, serious oral conditions that could predispose to endocarditis first. So I think um, there's not a gap in the guidelines. I think it's pretty clearly described in the guidelines, but in clinical practice, um, yes, I think there is, there is a bit of a gap. Yeah, within practitioners. All right, and then another question from Carl LaRue. Morning again. I might, I might have missed that remark, but would you recommend as prophylaxis in a relevant case, the two high dosage regimens, one large dosage an hour before the procedure and one lower dosage of 1.5 or one and a half hours after the procedure? And alternative is a course of relevant antibiotics for five days. So would you recommend this? No, that's no longer recommended. So um, those were old guidelines. Um, I can't even tell you how old, but long before the current guidelines. It's no longer recommended. Um, and I've put up the slide now from the ESC guidelines. You'll see very clearly, they say a single dose an hour before the procedure per arsenal intravenously. So no courses, no repeated doses, no before, after doses, one dose an hour before. Right, perfect. Um, I've, got, I've got two questions. Um, I'm going to just combine them because they seem a bit related. From Paul Betts and Elizabeth Lowe, uh, do patients with intravascular stents and pacemakers need prophylaxis? Um, so I think the stent question we've already answered. That's a previous question that we've had. Um, so I'm not going to, to answer that one again. Um, pacemakers, no. Um, they're not... Um, included in the guideline. Um, yeah, so, so really that they're just, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's true it is an intravascular device, um, but it's not specifically um, mentioned in the guideline if you look at the uh, yeah. patients at, at high risk. Um, I have another one, another question from JJ DeVette. Safety of NSAA. AIM after high by high of heart bypass act operation. Is it safe? Is safety of NSAIDs after a bypass operation. Yes. Um, well, I think that all depends on um, how long after. Um, mm. You know, it, 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 you know, most. Patients recover pretty well after a bypass operation, you know, after about six weeks. And I don't think you'll want to perform a dental procedure on most of them unless it's very, very urgent. So mm -hmm. NSAIDs might, um, you know, have, have many potential implications for someone like that. So kidney injury, um, excessive, you know, fluid accumulation, um, NSAIDs suppress inflammation. We know inflammation is important for healing. Um, after um, uh, after any kind of surgery, so mm -hmm. generally I would stay away from NSAIDs after a large product surgery. But I mean, if you have no other option, I suppose you can you can give it. But I wouldn't recommend it. I would rather use something alternative like um, a paracetamol if you can. Okay. I've got a lot of questions coming in. I'm just going to go through one. Emma Louise Lawrence asked, we've been asked to help with the vaccine rollout. So based on your warning with subcutaneous injections, should we make this a question on a medical history form for ourselves? Um, in other words, if a patient is on anticoagulation, well, I think that's always a relevant question. Um, mm -hmm not just in the context of COVID, because obviously as a, as a dentist or a dental hygienist, you will want to know this um, before you embark on any oral procedure, you would want to know if the patient is already anticoagulated. So it's, it's something that should be on your list in any case. And it just has an extra implication if you're going to perform any um, intramuscular injection. Mm. I think the, in, in fact, you know, the implications are even more serious um, in, in other instances. So, you know, the risk if you give an intramuscular injection and, um, you know, hematoma develops, it mm -hmm. might be painful, but it's not usually going to be a life-threatening situation. But if you um, have a patient with a prosthetic valve and um, 
uh, and, you know, and on oral anticoagulation, that's a very potentially serious um, situation and you need to know exactly what you're planning to do. So yes, I think it's, it's a very important question. It should be at the top of your list. Correct. All right, and then I've got one from um, Helena Vogel. A uh, patient had rheumatic heart disease as a child, had familiar, familial hypercholesterol, had stents placed in the heart blood vessels, and patient wants implants or dental implants. How should we proceed? So can, uh, there's a lot in that. Can I see that question? Okay. Yes. So it was rheumatic heart disease as a child, yes. familial hypercholesterol, and had yes. stents placed in the heart blood vessels, and the patient wants implants. Should okay, they? Okay. So. Yes, so the question is yes on two counts. So mm -hmm. not the stent, but the rheumatic valve. So as you will um, understand, the, the rheumatic um, valves are included in the South African um, Heart Association uh, proposal. So on account of that, yes, it's a high-risk patient. And um, uh, secondly, um, the dental implants, I think, again, if you look at the kind of procedure, um, it'll fall in the first category. So yes, I think that's definitely a situation where you will want to give prophylaxis. Thank you. Uh, we've got another one from Gerda Howard. Is cephalosporins not contraindicated for patients that are allergic to penicillin? Um, yes, so let's go back to that slide. Um, so let's go back to the EC guidelines. So at the bottom of the table, it says that cephalosporin should not be used in patients with a history of um, hypersensitivity to penicillin or ampicillin because there is an area of overlap and cross sensitivity. So um, the answer to that question is you should not give it. All right. Um, and then another question here from anonymous attendee. Um, if a patient has or had a hip or joint replacement, what is the waiting period before dental treatment? Obviously invasive dental treatment. Um, that's a good question. I, I think you, you, that's a question you had better, could better put to an orthopedic surgeon, but mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of um, infective endocarditis prophylaxis, I think I've already answered that previously. That's not on the list. It's not indicated. Um, but in terms of other procedures, well, that depends. I think if, if the patient is otherwise stable and not on any medication that would specifically interfere with the procedure you'd want to do, I don't see any, um, you know, any real reason to delay. But of course, you have to take the bigger picture into consideration. Um, for example, often patients are provided with um, anticoagulants after uh, big orthopedic surgery because they are immobile for a while and at risk of deep venous thrombosis. So for example, you'd want to know that and probably not perform dental procedures while they are still anticoagulated, but that's not usually a long-term thing. It's something that will be stopped um, after two weeks or so after the procedure and um, you know, then you can proceed normally. But if you're in doubt, um, contact the surgeon who performed the procedure. Okay, perfect. Um, I've got one from Rajima Jassim. Is prophylaxis required post myocardial infarction? No. I think that's a pretty simple answer. I mean, there's no specific, um, you know, predisposing lesion after an infarct that would be on the on the list. So. Uh, okay, and another question here from anonymous attendee: a patient with cardio. Um, heart disease or cardiovascular heart disease refuses to take uh, prophylaxis. What does one do in that type of situation? Um, you documented very clearly um, in your notes that you explained to the patient the risks. Um, the patient has had time to ask questions. The patient understands the, the risks um, and is happy to proceed with the dental procedure. And um, you sign it and the patient signs it, stays in your file, and that's what you can do. If the patient is not um, comfortable with proceeding with the procedure, um, then rather not give the patient some more time to consider. And if you are not comfortable with uh, proceeding in that circumstance, well, that, that's really, you know, it, it's a question to any medical or dental procedure. You have to decide if it's emergent, well, you need to go ahead. If it's not, there's really no obligation on you to, to proceed. 
Um, mm, so if yeah. the patient puts you in a, in a situation where you do not feel comfortable with taking the risk um, under the circumstances dictated by the patient and it's non-emergent, then mm -hmm. you don't have to do it. But again, the, the bottom line is documentation. If it's not written down, it never happened. Correct. All right, and we have another, I'm just gonna just do maybe three more questions um, from Jacobeth uh, Whitting. Good morning, thank you for the thorough research. If you were planning a non-invasive procedure and all of a sudden the procedure changes to invasive during the session, example, matrix band goes subgingival and causes bleeding. Is it still helpful to provide the antibiotic uh, prophylaxis even though it has not been taken 60 minutes prior? Well, I mean, there's no data, I think, to, to support you either way. But if you ask me what I would do, I would still give it. I mean, the rationale of giving it an hour before is obviously to expose your body to um, the circulating antibiotic, uh, you know, properly before the procedure in, uh, ensues. But, um, you know, if, you are, if you're changing during a procedure, you're still going to get some exposure um, in the more immediate um, time frame, and of course, post-procedure. So I would still give it. I think, you know, there's no data to, to support you either way, but I definitely think if it's a high-risk patient falling under the guidelines um, and it's a dental procedure that falls in that first category where you are going to, um, you know, manipulate the ginger ray or so and it's invasive, then I would definitely still give the prophylaxis. Okay. Um, another question, doctor, for how long does the medication or antibiotic remain in the bloodstream? Let's say a patient needs multiple dental procedures that cannot be done in a single visit. Yeah, so I can't tell you the half times of all the antibiotics, um, are, uh, you know, off pat. But the, the, the question is, to answer your question, that's not really relevant. So, I mean, it, it doesn't stay nearly long enough um, to wait. So if you look at, for example, the, the slide, the practical aspects of the AHA guideline. So it says, if you um, have just completed a course of antibiotics, and that's really similar to saying you've had a previous dose of antibiotic for prophylaxis, you need to wait 10 days before doing the next procedure. And if you look at the uh, British guidelines, the practical aspects, then they would say that if you do sequential procedures, so it's really answering the same question, but they answer it a bit more directly, um, an interval of 14 days. And if you cannot delay the procedure for that long, then use an alternative antibiotic. So don't use a penicillin again, swap it with something else. Um, again, it's just a, a, an expert recommendation. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an absolute. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, and I've got one more question that I'm going to um, ask quickly before time runs out from Elizabeth van der Ham. Uh, please explain signs of endocarditis. Yeah, so there are many, um, but the common ones are often very non specific. So, the, you know, the, the traditional teaching is goes like this if you have a, a a cardiac patient with a new murmur and a fever, you need to think endocarditis. Um, and fever is quite common, but symptoms can be very nonspecific, like any kind of infection. So patients feel unwell, they feel malaise, they feel tired, they might be um, feverish, sweaty, um, might have a loss of appetite, can't really, you know, always put your finger on it. If you have a stethoscope and you want to examine the patient, if you do hear a heart murmur, especially if you know it's a new heart murmur, that's an important um, sign. And then there are lots of other, uh, you know, more um, subtle signs, but you have to go looking for them very specifically. So there are some skin changes on your hands and embolic phenomena that you can see all over the body. So patients can develop strokes or infarctions of, of almost any um, organ in, in a conditus they often of kidneys or spleens, but that's usually at, at quite a late stage and the will be very ill um, at such a stage. I think if you're simply looking, uh, you know, for a screen, um, the things to look out for are general feelings of, um, you know, just unwellness, like any patient with an infection and fever. And if you, if you have the 
facility to listen to patients' heart, any heart murmur. Those are the really important things to, to look out for. And if you are in any doubt, just immediately refer the patient to a cardiologist because it can be subtle and you don't want to miss endocarditis because like I've mentioned on, on one of the first slides, if you don't treat it, the mortality is around 100%. Right, right. All right, um, we have run out of time for today. How can uh, members contact you if they have any questions or have any queries, um, Doc? Because um, I know there's a lot we haven't covered. <laughs> yes. So they are welcome to um, phone our practice, SA Endovascular. Um, shall I give you the telephone number? Yeah, you can. It's 021-900-2000. Right. SA Thank Endovascular you. in Coles River Hospital. Um, okay. Okay. They are more than welcome to phone me if they have any questions. Um, I'm also happy to enter into correspondence with someone. I'm not going to give my email now. If, if we you know, speak um, telephonically and you want to correspond with me, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to all the members from SARA and OHASA. Um, and your CPD certificates will be available for the OHASA members. CPD certificates will be available after we've received the register for today. And you'll be able to access them on the MPC site. And you'll also be able to access them on the SADA website as well. Uh, I hope everyone has a great day. I hope you had a great morning. I know it's a little bit chilly in Joburg. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us today and see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>